Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. This is a special international version of uh, <laughs> Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is sponsored, um, connected with, and involved with uh, Educator Innovator and the Summer to Make, Play, and Connect. Um, educator Innovator is at educator, um, ed, yeah, educator innovator. Dot org and makesummer.org is where to find the make, play, and connect information. Um, you know what? You guys, that those people are all our friends anyhow. And Chris Sloan is uh, doing makerspace stuff over in Ireland, and um, he'll explain his uh, connections and all. And Paul O was able to join us too because we have this special time here at noon. Eastern, 9 a.m. in Pacific time, and in Galway, Ireland, I think it's 5 p.m. Correct. And, <laughs> right. And, Michelle, what, what time is it where you are? It is Eastern time, so it is noon. Where are you? You're in Canada? I'm somewhere? in Ontario, Canada, yep. Great. So let's um, do introductions, if you don't mind, Chris, starting with you. Okay. My name is Chris Sloan. I am a high school English and media teacher at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. This summer, I'm um, an instructor with the Masters in the Arts of Educational Technology uh, through Michigan State. So I'm over with the overseas cohort in Galway, Ireland. And I have two of those members of the second year cohort with me right now. Cool. And Joshua, I don't know if you can hear oh. us yet, or if you can introduce you. Is Joshua? Joshua's hi, not yeah. one of those. Joshua, uh, hello? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, and hi, Chris and Michelle. Um, I'm a uh, PhD student at Michigan State University in their educational psychology and educational technology program. And I saw Michelle uh, shared some information about this on Facebook, and uh, here I am. <laughs> so just listening. Very cool. And we don't let you just listen, so we'll call on you again. But. Oh, great. All right. <laughs> All right. Michelle. Hi. Um, I'm Michelle Shira Hegerman. I am the Director of Graduate Certificate Programs in Educational Technology and Online Teaching and Learning at Michigan State University. I'm also a graduate of the EdPsych EdTech Doctoral Program. I just uh, finished up my PhD in the spring um, of this year. So, yeah, and I have the delightful responsibility of designing curriculum that includes sort of maker ideas. Um, so I've got some, yeah, experiences and some thoughts to share today about that. And did you have any part in choosing this book for the program? or? Um, actually, you know, Chris and Nelson um, introduced it to me. Uh, well, me, Graves Wolf, too. And so, you know, we've sort of integrated some of the ideas into um, the online course that um, students take, um, and then in the hybrid and overseas versions also. So, yeah, a little bit. Very cool. Paul, and if you could say more about um, Educator Innovator and Summer Make Play and Connect and other opportunities like this one that are available, it'd be great. Well, thanks. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, it's good to be on this call. Uh, I feel like this is the, the World Cup of TTT. Uh, it's so international, the flavor. That's uh, good to see you all. And um, my name is Paul O. I work, work for the National Ryan Project. I'm based in Berkeley, California in the US. And I am essentially managing our educator innovator work. Um, we have uh, Educator Innovator is both a website, so as Paul mentioned, you can visit the site at educatorinnovator.org, but it's also a network of networks. We have a, a series, of, a whole array of partners um, who are sharing work and opportunities for educators, both formal and informal, in school and out, uh, that have uh, one similar feature being uh, that they're related to um, connected learning in some way, but we have many organizations that are involved in making um, from MakerEd to DIY.org um, to uh, many different groups that are just really interested in, in understanding the affordances of making and, and the impact um, and potential for making um, and the maker ethos in schools and in educational settings. Uh, so it's exciting to be here. In terms of the MakeSummer.org space, um, 
Xsummer.org is, is a web space uh, that is um, essentially a, a holding spot for um, a few different initiatives that are happening this summer and beyond. So in the case of Educator Innovator, you know, we are part of the Make Summer campaign, which is being run by the Connected Learning Alliance. Um, and uh, I can say more about what connected learning is later. But, um, but you know, of course, we, we run beyond the summer. But there's also a summer sort of time-limited kind of experience that's happening um, that is being supported by and hosted by the Mozilla Foundation. So that's called Maker Party. And, uh, and you can find Maker Party events at the makesummer.org site. Um, as well, they're listed at um, the Maker Party site and at Educator Innovator. And then there's also this initiative called Cities of Learning. So it's um, essentially um, making opportunities for young people in a few different cities around the country. Um, and uh, that also is happening in this time limited way during the summer, um, LA, there was, you know, uh, is one city, Chicago, Dallas, um, there are a few others if you check out the site. Um, so, so makesummer.org, just to recap, is, is this initiative that's happening this summer under which, you know, there uh, is Educator Innovator, which is an educator facing space and set of opportunities, Webmaker, which is, you know, young people and adults, um, and Cities of Learning, which is very much youth facing. And, and my only half joke that I will make about this is that if you're listening to this as a, as a, um, on a recording, why? Um, because there's probably something live happening right now, and you should go get involved in the conversation. But, <laughs> but seriously, it's kind of amazing how many live things are going on all the time, mm -hmm. um, especially mm -hmm. in the same time. But anyway, uh, other introductions here? That's you, Brian. Uh, yeah. Tom, and then your friend, uh, is it uh, Dan? Dan, Dan and Tom. Yeah, right. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Tom Spackman. I'm an early childhood music teacher at the American School of the Hague. I live in Amsterdam, and I'm here doing, doing my second year of the three-year uh, Master's of Arts in Education Technology uh, overseas cohort that's offered from Michigan State University. So I, Chris was my teacher last year. <laughs> and I'm Dan Priest. I teach at the Monroe County Middle College in Michigan, and I teach English and History. This is my second year in the program, and I also had Chris as an educator last year. Teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and both of them did um, have done some pretty innovative um, work, you know, that falls in the maker category that they'll, I'd like them to talk about maybe in a little bit. Cool. So, um, Sylvia Martinez and Gary Steger um, uh, have written a book called Invent to Learn, and we want to have some conversation, and, and I don't know, just to use one of their metaphors um, for our conversation, they've said that the curriculum should be a boy instead of a boat, <laughs> and so we'll use their book as a boy for this conversation, a buoy, if I said that correctly. Um, instead of a boat, just, but um, let's talk a little bit about why the book and what you, your interest was in including it in your work this summer. Chris, could you? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so. And, uh, sorry, Chris, I, I meant to say that this is part one of a two-part conversation that will continue on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern and... 6 p.m. Galway, and that's what, 10 a.m. in the Pacific, uh, out there in California, and so forth. Eric, go ahead, Chris, sir. Yeah, so um, it was a couple of months ago I was talking to Paul O about um, just some of the things I was up to, and I uh, mentioned that um, I was interested in this book. I was reading um, Invent to Learn uh, at the time, and... Um, then, you know, I had last summer connected with a maker space here in Galway, Ireland called 091 Labs. And um, the book, um, the reason I wanted to have the authors talk to us uh, is because um, a lot of times it seems like with the making movement, people are almost um, under the impression or give the impression that it's brand spanking new. Um, and... What I like about the um, the book is, you know, it's it's connected to a lot of educational history. So, you know, it 
there's really important connections in all this making, and, and we all know this, I guess, but I think they articulate it well. John Dewey, um, Piaget, and then one of the key figures, you know, Seymour Papert um, from MIT, um, really, I think, you know, who, who, among other things, invented Logo or started, you know, helped begin that. Scratch is kind of developed from his work. Um, and actually, Brendan, who is not going to be able to join us here, he's, uh, he lives in Galway, um, spent some time at MIT and worked with uh, a lot of the people mentioned in the book. Um, so we'll try to get him on for next week. <clears throat> but anyway, um, I was struck by the ties to educational history and that, um, you know, making is really not new. It's just the way we're kind of you know, reinventing making, I guess, for schools now. And, and it's interesting because for some people, uh, making makes a lot of sense. Um, for other people, they question it, you know, like, how's this going to fit or, you know, it doesn't work for me. So I think it's an interesting time for the movement and to kind of see how it fits into um, the, the whole landscape. And I think um, Michelle has, we've had some conversations about it. And I'm wondering your thoughts about, you know, the book and, and how it kind of helps inform making. Yeah, for sure, Chris. So um, I design, well, revised and designed with Lee Graves Wolf, a course um, offered at Michigan State University. And we do the course um, online for the most part all year long. Every seven weeks, um, students start this class. And the, the real... Um, interesting thing about the class is it it has always been about innovative uses of technology in education and last year we completely redesigned this class to include ideas of making um, so that teachers could really grapple with ideas of construction of knowledge using a range of um, found materials maker kits you know conductive tape what have you and uh, yeah Chris you know the response from our online students has been really mixed, and I would say that the majority perspective has been that it lacks relevance to their classroom practice. And I've repeatedly seen this um, comment, or you know, a, a version of that comment, in their end of course um, evaluations. You know, things like "this is just not going to help me." I resent having to buy this maker kit. <laughs> And you know, and I think that uh, based on their feedback, I mean, we've done lots of revision and iteration, and really tried to leverage some of the ideas from the book as sort of as a foray kind of into the maker movement. Um, it's not something for a lot of people that you know they can just jump into and immediately see the connections. Um, and I so I think that the book does a really good job of that. And so we definitely have leveraged. Um, You'd invent to learn as an introduction to the ideas of construction of knowledge and really thinking about, as you say, kind of the historical perspective of making and how this isn't really anything new, um, but that we can integrate maybe some new technologies in ways that support you know, interdisciplinary thinking in new ways. So that's definitely been, um, you know, my use for the book for sure. So, I, and let me just uh, latch onto that a little bit and say that not only the history, but but it's a specific history that they're latching onto, as you as you mm -hmm. explained, Chris. But it's um, a progressive history, I think they call mm -hmm. it. Um, and and I was just uh, one of the phrases that I underlined uh, or was that uh, they their their thought is that making might open up schools to change curricular content, combine subjects, reconfigure class organization, age, um, age segregation, um, change authentic learning experiences connected to the world to the world outside of school, reject behaviors and resist exter external assessment. I mean that kind of um, agenda being attached to making I think is interesting. Um, I mean, I certainly, <laughs> yeah. So I'm certainly with that agenda, and I just wonder if, if um, how other people feel about their attachment of making to that agenda. Is that? 
Well, I think it's pretty exciting, actually. <laughs> I, mean, uh -huh. I mean, I love it. I mean, I love the fact that it is, um, you know, giving people sort of a, 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 a way to think about um, the resistance of behaviorism or, you know, thinking about creativity and interdisciplinary thinking and constructing knowledge. I think that it's give, I, I think that the book really does give language um, to that, um, you know, the resistance, so to speak, you know, just, I, I really, I, 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 I'm totally supportive of that agenda myself. Because I, because I think it's good for, I mean, because I think it's good for kids. I think it's good for learning. I think it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's really making learning authentic in ways that many of the things that happen in schools are not. So, um, Tom, if I could just, your, oh, go ahead, Paul, and I'll get back to my questions. Uh, well, so, yeah, I, I was just going to jump in and say that I think, um, I, you know, so, yes, I, I think that making has the potential that you were just describing, Paul, uh, as was uh, articulated in the book. Um, I think that, though, uh, well, so I don't know if this is a though comment, but I think what's true is that, to me, this is not necessarily uh, the, the, the movement that, that I think we're all gravitating towards. Um, it's not necessarily just about making. Um, I think making is a piece of this. Uh, mm -hmm. I, think making, <clears throat> I think making identifies something. Uh, and mm -hmm. the thing that I think it identifies is this notion of, of um, putting in the hands of kids this uh, idea that they can be production-centered, to borrow a term from connected mm -hmm. learning. Um, and not just young people, but I think adults as well. <clears throat> and so I think if we think in, in, in a broader frame, if we see making as the articulation or as the manifestation of say, a, a framework um, that, you know, that is connected learning, uh, I think it's possible then to see how um, all these, all these uh, different manifestations of what education can look like, you know, might occur. Because I think, it, I think it's also easy for others. I mean, I've been in many conversations where people are like, oh, so, so like if you give kids saws, like that's going to reform schools, you know. Like so, I think that there's this, there's there's this sort of surface level understanding of making, and so to me, it's not necessarily about making. It's about this this framework, this notion of um, production centered, this ability to give you know young people and adults opportunities to work um, in community in community with one another. You know, which again, going back to the connected learning framework, is this notion of um, peer support. Um, or being in an online community of mentors, um, this idea of having shared purpose. So that's not simply that we're all just making things, and you know, and it's interest driven, but that at times, you know, we're we're creating for some social purpose, essentially. Uh, so I think once you know, once we can think of making as being an element in in this larger framework, then I think what you're describing is really possible, or not what you're describing, but what you know. Gary and Sylvia are describing their book is really possible. Yeah, um, I'm wondering about um, the two classroom teachers that we have with us, kind of their take on what you're hearing here. Like, uh, you know, how does making kind of fit for you, or is it a stretch, that kind of stuff? Well, for, for me, uh, a lot of the work that we did last year, I, I use the Making Makey a lot in, in my coursework with uh, the MAET program. And I found a, a very, a very applicable use for it in my classroom in, in terms of, of uh, creating music interfaces for kids to, to, to make and then make music with. But it, as far as uh, teaching my my own curriculum, that that wasn't so much what I used it for. It was actually creating um, new curriculum, and, and that, that that's the interesting part for me is using these tools for not necessarily teaching what I have been teaching for years, but but um, allowing me to teach brand new skills and showing kids to make music in, in brand new ways. And Michelle, you were saying something about um, the inter interdisciplinary use for this, and, and that, that's what I really see, is you doing a unit with my you know, science teacher at my school with the Makey Makey on instrument creation or the art teacher, and, and that's how I can, I can really see useful in my, in my practice. Can you say a little more about like how that looked working with uh, like what kinds of things did you do and uh, well we, we actually didn't do the, the project with I didn't do the project with my art teacher but I what, what I want to do uh, is have her work with conductive paint and other conductive materials 
so that w with the kids so that they'll create interfaces to play a song that I teach them in my class. But in, in that, I'm not actually teaching anything new um, musically. I'm not teaching any new musical skills, but it is combining my curriculum with, with the other teachers in my school. And, and is, is music your field, or is that what you teach? Yes, yeah, I'm, a, okay. I'm an early childhood music teacher. So can, can I push you a little bit um, from sure. a skeptical point of view, <laughs> right? So making Mickey's Absolutely. cool. I, I, I love making, you know, sounds out of bananas, but how does it teach music? You know, I mean, there's, there, there's a, it's a big leap between that and teaching music, isn't it? No, it's, it's not actually teaching any music skills that I'm, that I'm not already doing. What it's allowing kids to do is to, mm -hmm. to create new ways to play the music that they already have. So you, you're absolutely right. It's not teaching any musical skills that I'm not already teaching. But it does allow for some kind of cross-disciplinary work with my, with my colleagues. Um, can I jump in? You know, I'm not a music teacher, but I wonder, um, this is a question for you, whether this is true too. Like, I can imagine that developing um, some sort of musical performance with Makey Makey uh, in order to do that, you have to have some systems thinking skills in place. You need to be able to understand how systems operate. And I would, I'm, not, I'm not musical, so I'm just guessing at this, but I can imagine that um, being able to play music is also a demonstration of the ability to understand a system, um, a very complex system. And so though there's not direct you know, music teaching, there is also this, uh, this teaching of um, a set of skills that I think you know could ultimately be transferable. You know, as you move from one complex system to another, there is some. So I guess, it, but, yeah. but also the the fact that people play music together on these these instruments that they make, and so they have to. It's it's also working together to make music. Mm -hmm. If I can just jump in, I mean that is absolutely something that um, we saw last week. Uh, our Masters of Ed Tech students at Michigan State University um, hosted a maker fair, and one team had members of the public come in and play music using a makey makey, um, and that was it was fascinating actually to watch um, the collaboration. So people came in as strangers, and they sat down together, and they had to figure out the system, right? Understand how to complete the the electrical circuit. They had to understand really how to make music together. And it would always start off very tentatively, you know, like just kind of hitting one another's hands yeah. to complete the circuit. But then this magical thing happened where they were creating rhythm and there was almost sort of like this harmonious thing that transpired in a matter of like a minute maybe. And that was very powerful. And um, so I think you're right, um, you know, Paul. Just going back to sort of one of the ideas um, that you talked about earlier was right, community and shared purpose, and the social purpose of that particular activity was really powerful. Um, and you know, do you see that same thing happening in your classroom? Right, they come in and there's something different that happened as a result of the way that activity was set up. That was very social and. And, and very much grounded in this idea of systems. And I think it's experiencing common things in new ways. So yeah. on the one hand, you know, you could say it's playing bananas and, and you could do that already, but it's playing bananas. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's um, like all of a sudden music becomes maybe playful where it maybe it wasn't before. Or I was working with uh, paper circuits yesterday. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was into the look and everything, but I was experiencing circuits in a way that I don't think I do very often. You know, like I'll fix stuff around the house and, you know, twist some wires together and that kind of thing. But this, um, you know, I had to kind of relearn circuit. You know, it's basic stuff, but um, doing it because I wanted to draw something out of copper tape um, made me kind of revisit a simple concept that I realized I didn't um, remember like parallel circuit versus that other kind. The series, series. Circuit, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it, I think Paul A. It, it's also experiencing 
common things in new ways and makes them new again. Mm -hmm. Other How thoughts? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, a, a phrase. Let me um, point to a phrase that uh, Sylvia and Gary use often in the book: um, creating something shareable. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so that feels like an or something that's really important, and something that Chris, you and I have done a lot on Youth Voices. That um, you know, by creating things, by writing things, by making things that we sh then share, right? Um, that that is that's really an, an important thing for young people to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, I do worry, and I wonder if the if the Michelle, the teachers' responses to the um, you know the make kits that they had to get. Um, are too much, and again, <laughs> pulling this out of their book, are too much like Boy Scouts, too much like, um, you know, fun games that you put on the refrigerator, and they, they don't necessarily end up in making things that are shareable. Um, that, yeah, you know, that's possible. I mean, obviously, we, we try in the design of the curriculum to, you know, give students full range to, to choose to do something that is authentic and meaningful to them in their practice. Mm -hmm. But I think that sometimes coming up with that very idea, you know, finding finding a way to make it authentic is a worry and it it's 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 hard to do if if you also don't understand the affordances of the kit that you've just mm -hmm. opened up and you see the wires and you kind of just don't even know where to start. And so, um, you know, there's a lot for us to learn about how to teach people to engage with these ideas. And um, for me, that's been actually a really a important journey professionally to really think about how do you get people to engage in this inherently social um, activity of co-creating. I'm sorry, the telephone's ringing in the background. Okay. Um, how do you get people to engage in that process when they're doing it online, right, which is uh, a modality of learning that is, you know, it has barriers of time and space and interactivity alone, right? So that's been quite challenging. But I think to the extent that we can get people to share their ideas, that sharing piece can really inspire, right, the snowballing of the ideas. Mm -hmm. And the, the course is seven weeks long? Is that what you said? Yeah, it used to be eight, now it's seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, yeah, I mean, watching CL MOOC happen, and which is, I think, a six or seven week mm -hmm. experience, too. It's a, I mean, those people are creating online, too. One of my questions also has to do with um, creating on computers and creating physically. Mm -hmm. um, can somebody who has more experience with that comment I, on that? But, I yeah. can speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, I felt a lot of frustration last year when we were given the making activity. I was I had to deal with Raspberry Pi, and it was the worst thing <laughs> I I was ever been tasked with doing. Um, so, which is why I completely abandoned so, it. What and did it look like when else. you opened it? What I mean, describe more. What, yeah. The Raspberry Pi. Yeah. It, it was it was a mess of wires <laughs> and you know this little motherboard and there was a slot to put an Ethernet cord in and a USB thing that but like that was it and I'm an English teacher I'm a teacher yeah <laughs> it's like I don't know what I'm doing with this mm -hmm. and we couldn't get it to work there was no TV we could hook it up to there was no computer monitor we could hook it up to. And so that was just really weird for me. So I abandoned it, and I printed something on a 3D printer. <laughs> yeah, so um, Dan, talk a little bit about um, your conception of, you know, we had a conversation about how to make making work in the language arts classroom. Because a lot of, you know, if you look at Invent to Learn, making, tinkering, and engineering in the classroom, and a lot of it is kind of, I think, math, uh, engineering oriented. And so um, we did talk about how to make that relevant in something like an English language arts class. And um, Dan, can you talk about how? Because I think you really did. That assignment turned out to be something that's relevant. Yeah, and it was nice to have something physical to leave with and to share with other people. 
and I shared it with my students when I got back in September. Um, but my idea uh, was centered around Harry Potter because it's been part of my life. Uh, and the, the whole the whole project itself, sorry, this is very pleasant. Uh, the whole project itself uh, dealt with, um, I asked my students to do a book report project and they can respond to it in any genre whatsoever. So it can be something digital, it can be something musical, it can be something in print. Um, but now I'm looking at more di you know, different ways to do that. And so the whole idea was why couldn't they make something from the book? And so I went through the thought process of, okay, I'm on a community college campus, even though I teach high schoolers, they have 3D printers there. And what if these kids had access to those 3D printers and you know what, to really prove to me that they read the book, that they enjoyed the book, that they could take one of the descriptions of some of these things and they can make a physical object. Um, you know, we're really invested in what they read and so I made a snitch. I uh, designed one, I, I printed out uh, a ball, two halves of a ball, I designed wings to go into that, and I put it together and I made a snitch. And you know, I could walk away from Ireland last year. Fairly insane. Um, never having done 3D printing before, never having done anything in the 3D space before. Rudimentary, but it looked like the thing, it you know, was fantastic. And, uh, like I was so, I felt so accomplished when I did that, and I was the only one there who could really physically show off like the final product and take it home with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also made a video to show my thought process and, and just the, the 3D printing process and all that, just to then I could share that as well. You know, this was my thought process. Here's everything that went into this, which uh, helped me um, actually really understand like my students could do this. And uh, some of them are going into classes where they can use 3D printers now, and I'm interested to see what they're going to make out of that. And uh, I dropped the link to Dan's video in the chat room there. Um, you know, when he showed that, um, everybody's jaw just dropped um, because, like he said, okay, this is a day where he connected with someone down at this maker space that I was talking about. Um, Dan sketched out some ideas first, right? And then, um, I don't know if you rendered anything on computer or Alana took some of the rend, did some of that. No, I, no, I rendered it all. Okay, I, yeah. I drew a snitch wing and made it 3D and... But to me, like, that's a, a powerful example of, okay, to understand a text, um, to, to make something from text, that means I have to know the book well enough, go to the part well enough, read with enough detail, understand why that's an important thing from a book, whatever book you're doing. Um, to me, uh, as an English language arts teacher, uh, I saw a lot of possibilities for that. Um, and just the video itself is like um, just really high quality, but it also documents his process. So if I'm interested in doing this project in the future, um, you know, he he shows at least like the steps that he took uh, to do that. And I think I want to go back to that quote, Paul, that you mentioned earlier, because it's based on Seymour Papert's work. Um, it's when Gary and Sylvia are talking about Seymour Papert's books like Mindstorms and The Children's Machine and The Connected Family. And they say that the message of learning by actively constructing knowledge through the act of making something shareable. I just want to loop back to that point because I think that is really one of the things that is the counter to all this talk of like making doesn't really work in the classroom. It's when it's divorced from you know the social aspect of learning I think um, if it's not shareable, if it's just something I'm doing for this moment and it doesn't connect, um, you know like that's not meaningful and it's not going to work. But I think Dan's thing is powerful because of, you know, he did make something shareable and, you know, elegant. And Dan, just to clarify, you um, you did the rendering on what? On, on the computer in what program or how did you do that? Uh, I used several different programs. One was called Animator with an 8 in the name. It's a little annoying. But, uh, uh -huh. I think that's what it's called. Uh, and uh, 
we, I used a couple other programs. I did have some help, and it was a collaboration between me and uh, this woman at, at the Maker Lab that she had just been experimenting with this, and I found out she had just built it, built the 3D printer a month ago, or a month before we had done this. This is the first original thing she had printed. She had been printing like the same robot over and over and over again, and then now she was just so excited because like, oh my god, you know, look, <laughs> I've been able to make something, and in fact it was my something that you know, she was able to make, so. Enjoy that. Very cool. That's a great story, Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, you know, I wanted to jump in and, and just. Try again, Paul. Uh, oh, can you hear me now? You're you're back. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say that this whole this whole um, question that you raised, Chris, and your response, Dan, with regard to so how, how do we understand making in an English language arts classroom? You know, I, I work for an organization called the National Writing Project, and and we have teachers who are asking this question, you know, constantly, uh, and and so we we uh, organized a day, we being educator innovator, um, along with a couple of educator innovator partners, a couple of days ago, related to paper circuitry. So I don't know if this is why you were working on paper circuitry yesterday, Chris, but um, but you know, we had this hack your notebook day, and um, what's interesting about the work is, first of all, it's it's related to paper circuitry, um, but. Uh, you know, it's focused on this notion of a notebook, which is, you know, very, um, it's, a, it's a tool that's used in multiple disciplines. So that was one thing that was appealing about the notebook. Um, what, what was interesting about the process, first of all, the paper circuitry work I think is really brilliant, and I'll, I'll throw a link into the Hack Your Notebook Day um, possibility, uh, or, you know, a website where you can learn more about it um, in the chat. But, um, you know, the paper circuitry work involves, like, copper tape, uh, um, actually, you know, sticker LED lights. Um, so really, really interesting technologies. Um, they, the lights are programmable. Ultimately, you know, you can use um, Arduino to program the lights. Uh, you know, the uh, small watch batteries that power up. You know, essentially these circuits that uh, that light up um, paper. Um, but what's fascinating about the notebook, I think, is that. Typically, you know, particularly for those of us who, who have this, you know, history in, in writing or as writers or in teaching writing, you know, the notebook is this, like, you know, often iconic, very personal, you know, not shared thing unless, you know, you're sort of asked to or, you, you know, you know beforehand that you're going to. Um, but what we found that was really fascinating, I, I, or at least what I found was really fascinating about this process was we made it possible for people, well, first of all, people came together to hack their notebooks. So this goes back to, I think, um, this, uh, this idea um, uh, raised by Michelle earlier about, you know, the, the social elements of the work. Um, so, so people came together in face-to-face -face ways and hacked their notebooks together, which is, you know, great, uh, really interesting, fascinating work. I mean, we heard people talk about just how important it was to be able to be together because, um, you know, as English teachers, they didn't really pay attention during, you know, the science classes in high school. And so to have someone who, you know, a colleague who was able to figure this, you know, science circuitry piece out and then share that was really important. But then we also provided these avenues for people to share their work in online spaces. And people loved doing that. I mean, they, you know, they posted all kinds of images and um, and, and their work and, and short videos of their work. Um, so I think, you know, going back to this idea of, of making your work pu public, I think, to me, it was very interesting that, you know, this, this item, which is often thought of as this very personal, you know, sort of private um, artifact, uh, people were really eager to share their work. And then I just want to say one, one other thing about um, this, uh, this notion that Dan raised uh, about giving his kids an opportunity to express, you know, what they understood about um, Harry Potter um, with a physical artifact. You know, one of the teachers we talked to, and a number of teachers, I think, had this perspective. Um, there were high school English teachers, mainly, who would say things like, you know, I, I didn't really see the relevance. I didn't understand, well, like, why, you know, why do I want my kids to understand circuits? You know, what does that have to do with any of the requirements that I have to meet, you know, as an English teacher? And this one guy in particular, you know, a very thoughtful guy. Um, he teaches uh, high school English, and he was saying, you know, I didn't really understand, like I teach Shakespeare, like so what does this have to do with Shakespeare is how he started off, you know, the conversation. And as we talked more, I mean, and you know, and he struggled actually with the, the circuitry part and he kind of gave up. But as we, as we talked more, you know, we began to uh, think about 
um, at least for this hack your notebook work, which involved lighting things up, you know, about in the text itself or in Shakespeare text, um, notions of light and dark, and the ways in which um, you know kids could take up those themes um, and you know illuminate their thinking or illuminate those those elements, those themes in the in in the texts, and you know, and that that made sense to him. Um, so I think he was thinking about like the the paper circuitry work as somehow being separate in the way in which our schools are often, you know, the disciplines are separated. But like, I think, you know, um, giving kids, as you were saying, Dan, this opportunity to actually, you know, make a physical representation of what they understand as an analysis of a text, you know, I think is, is you know, not something that people think about immediately, but I think is, is a really powerful possibility. Yeah, Paul, I actually want to just jump in and say that I um, I blogged about that very thing, actually, at reading.org um, a few months ago, and the idea that light, you know, has such meaning, and to create sort of an artistic representation of something that is connected to a text, a literary text, or an informational text, right, and then to integrate a light um, using paper circuits, I think is a very powerful way for students to think about right the representation the symbolic value the importance of that idea and I do think that that is just a terrific sort of foray into making right for particularly for English language arts teachers who are often the people searching for the meaning in this work um, and and just to piggyback on what you were saying Paul I mean in our experience as well um, that paper circuits really is the thing I think that seems in some ways sort of the least threatening, right? Because you're 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 repurposing objects that you know, right? You know how a notebook works. I mean you have you have an affection probably for that that space, right? As a as a place for writing down ideas and capturing thoughts. And so to take that thing that people love to use and to just add in something unique like a circuit to hack it. Um, the way you've talked about, we've really found that is a way to help many people bridge, um, you know, that idea of sort of how is how is this uh, relevant. Um, at a Maker Fair uh, that we hosted actually at a at a conference in Michigan, we had people put a light into their name badges, and um, right that everybody gets a name badge at the conference, and people came to our um, booth. And they added just a simple circuit, right, with that battery, the conductive copper tape, um, the sticky tape, uh, and they put a light in. And the other thing that I really saw was just how profoundly delighted people were when that light lit up. You know, like they put it strategic, but again, like they put it, we encourage them to think about where you're going to place the light, right? Like place it in a way that has meaning. Um, and and people did, and it was just fascinating to see how creative with just that very simple activity people could be. And then suddenly they saw so many applications, and then we started getting these tweets and videos and images back from people who'd been at the conference saying, "Hey, I had my students do something similar." And so, um, Paul, I think that that work that you're doing, I mean, it's it's completely consistent with the observations that we've definitely had in our program at Michigan State. That's great cool. to know. Yeah. I'll put the link to the blog post too in the in the chat. Yeah, I would love that. Mm -hmm. So um, here's okay. So <laughs> another another perspective for a second. I mean, can you be a maker? And and I'm, I'm and this is a rhetorical question because I think you can be in your classroom and not deal with circuits, right? Um, and not deal with um, oh, yeah. The stuff that lights up. So, for, so right now at, in our Youth Voices Summer Program that we're doing um, with the New York City Writing Project, one of the things that we're doing with the notebook is that um, our students and teachers who are in the program together um, write in a physical notebook on paper, you know, for um, a certain amount of time each day, and then they think about, and, and that's private. And then they think about how my. Then they put it up on a Google Doc, which has been made public and linked to um, places on their profile on Youth Voices, that, so other people can see it. So there's this constant kind of thought about, okay, I'm making something public. Um, I have this private notebook. Um, typing is different than handwriting. 
Um, you know, when I get up to uh, the Google Doc, I could make put links in. I can, you know, make uh, images uh, in it. I could, you know, do what you can do online. Um, and and we and we're expanding that further to say, okay, you could also record and put up uh, your your journal, or you could make your journal into a video journal. So that's making two. And I just I just want to say that. It just feels to me that we don't want to limit the making community to, you know, the new making stuff. <laughs> is that we need to keep? And, and so teachers may be making already, is what I want to suggest. And we need to kind of recognize that and and you know, say that. Well, I, and, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I wanted to mention that I, I, I tried with some colleagues a, a maker club with my, I, I teach in a, an early childhood building, so it's just three-year-olds to seven-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And we tried um, a two-month maker club every Thursday. And I pull out the Makey Makey, and the kids only played with it for one of the four days that we had. The rest of the time, they were building big structures out of balloons or, or building, like, houses out of wood or paper clothes or... And I guess I was just thinking as you guys were talking, it, it, did we not name that club correctly? Because the make, you know, the, the makey makey was there for you know like one eighth of the time. So maybe we that maybe that's a craft club or something. But I I think it, it has as much to do with the mentality that you bring, uh, not necessarily the materials that you use. So and what is that mentality? Do you think? Um, I, I think it has to do with. Uh, creating something uh, and knowing how something works, and and using as many different tools as you can to make that something. Um, and, and I'm not, I have my kids use um, uh, GarageBand with iPads to to arrange their own songs and mix it with already existing loops. Um, and I, I would probably call that a, a a making project, but but I'm I'm not sure if I if I can because I'm I'm still trying to understand you know, what it means to be a maker and what it means to be making. Um, yeah, I mean, that's you know, a good example, yeah. <laughs> I think of Joe Paraiso, you know, in Oakland, and the, the idea where she was teaching Shakespeare, and they went and got discarded, um, you know, junk, and made props for um, the play. And to me, like, that's... I'm really intrigued by people who are doing kind of this making out of stuff that already exists, instead of, you know, always buying kits and, and making new stuff to make. Um, you know, the people who are now, um, you know, you've seen these YouTube videos of the African um, young men who, um, you know, he just made a windmill out of the stuff that was just junk there. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a real physical dimension to making, and what I was saying earlier was that's been around for a long time. I think back to, like, quilting bees and barn raisings and right. threshing rings. Um, Farmers, you know, like, right? Yeah, right? I mean, people were really, um, I think, yes. bringing community together to make those things that are important to the community is um, a big part of, I think, the maker movement. Like, what are we making and what good is it um, for all of us or, you know, our community is, is one lens to look at the projects that, um, making projects that work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if... Oh, go ahead, Michelle. Go ahead, Paul. No, it's fine. Well, I, I was just going to add um, to... So if we were to take Paul's question and, and um, push it even further, so, like, so, for instance, you know, would uh, the creation of a five-paragraph essay, um, you know, is that making? And, you know, and, and I mean, uh, you know, part of me says that, yes, you, you've made something. Um, but to me, like, the, the question is less about, like, is it making, is it not making, am I a maker, am I not a maker? Uh, again, I would go back to, uh, you know, some sort of framework to understand, like, what, what you know, what, what, it, what, what it is that's being made and for what purpose and by whom, you know, what is the intent. And um, so, again, like, you know, I pan back to the Connected Learning Framework, which talks not just about, you know, like, are you a maker, are you not a maker? I mean, to me, like, those distinctions don't matter as much. Um, what matters is, you know, are you engaging your young people as much as possible in pr production-centered um, kinds of activities? And do those production-centered activities have some kind of, um, uh, you know, interest-driven lens? Um, 
you know that so so there's relevance and and um, and and that that's you know important and I would say that the work that you're doing at Youth Voices, Paul, you know, fits that criteria for sure. Um, I think you know what you were describing um, with your young people and the makey makey, you know, that fits for sure too. I mean, so. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would look at those criteria versus like, am I a maker? Am I not? Is this making? Is this not making? And vice versa, you could solder something together and not really be doing anything of interest or productive, right? Yeah. Well, because I think also the thing that matters is um, is the iterative process, right? It's the improvement process. Mm -hmm. It's thinking about, you know, not doing it according to a script so that it's done, right? So, Paul, your example of the five-paragraph essay, right? That is a very scripted, structured genre of writing that, you know, is often introduced as, you know, you will have an introduction, you will have conclusion, the introduction will have a topic sentence, the conclusion will return back to the introduction. You know, and the three, the, the three paragraphs in the middle, you know, will address three particular points or questions. You know, it's a very scripted thing. Um, and just, you know, returning back to um, sort of what the book Invent to Learn talks about is just this, the, the design process, right? It's the thinking, it's mm -hmm. the making of something, but then it's the reflection piece. And it's reflecting on how to improve this thing and understanding fundamentally that that, that is a part of the design and the making um, process and that iteration is essential. And, and, and I think that's, that's not always the way that, that we in schools approach learning Right? We, we oftentimes approach learning as, well, there is a right way or there is a right answer. So for me, that's a differentiator in terms of if it's a making or not making. The question is, is there revision and iteration included? And I think teachers do that all the time. I mean, I was just seeing some similarities as I was rereading this today in preparation for our talk and you know, thinking about the action research process, right, of professional development. If we think about how we grow as teachers, Right? It's absolutely through that process of thinking about what is it that I did today, how well did it go, what can I improve on so that tomorrow it's better. And to me, you know, that's even a version of making because there is that iterative piece. And um, I want to just add something from the book because I think this is interesting. Um, they talk about, you know, how, how should we plan and evaluate projects, like what kind of mm -hmm. criteria, and I kind of like their list here. Ask if the project is beautiful, thoughtful, personally meaningful, sophisticated, shareable with respect for the audience, moving, and enduring. And that's kind of a nice little set. Mm -hmm. It is hard to do all of that all the time, but yes. Well, yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I take a day off every now and then. Endurable. <laughs> uh, everything I... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to quote from the book, too. One of the, I, in their thinking about thinking chapter, I, which I think is really wonderful, um, there's a, they, they talk about making is a way of documenting the thinking of a learner in a shareable artifact. Mm -hmm. Stages of project under construction offer important evidence of productive thinking or scaffolding opportunities. Again, it's the making physical of the iterative process, which, Michelle, you so clearly identified. Um, which I think is, is so important. And, and as a writing teacher, you know, um, it was good to be reminded through their description of the design process and how the design has changed because of computers, because we can prototype more quickly, yeah. because, you know, we can um, mm -hmm. change things around. Like, um, I, think, I think we've done that with computers, and, and writing teachers need to be reminded of that, that, you know, we can publish unfinished stuff, right, and get response to it, yeah. and then keep working on it. Um, so it's, I mean, this is not new that, you know, the process isn't, isn't step by step, right, but it, it's a good, it's a good another take on the writing process, and how can we make writing making is, mm -hmm. is, 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 I think, a really good question. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting that this question, actually, I was in another conversation not long ago with a couple of um, scholars, uh, Greg McVeary and Ian O'Byrne, who both are in Connecticut at different institutions, and um, yeah, Ian, or I mean, sorry, Greg was actually saying that for him, I mean, his making really is his writing, because it is this process of constant, you know, thinking, 
and then putting words to page and or screen and then iterating and improving it constantly. Um, I just think that that is a really powerful way to think about writing. Yeah. And at, at my, um, I'm at a, it will be a second year school soon. Um, one, of, one of the things that we've been thinking about is how do we describe the things that count in a portfolio? Um, and I actually think your your list there, Michelle, I, I, and it is from the book too. Of yeah. you know, is there invention, iteration, and revision? You know, um, can you and can you see that process? Mm -hmm. That it, then you can include that in the portfolio, <laughs> which is I, I think that's an interesting kind of definition. But yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And I, I just wanted to mention that it's. Uh, I think the the whole portfolio question is also a really fascinating one with regard to um, you know making and and the artifacts that result from making. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I mean, many of you may know this, but uh, there, there's a there's a lot of work that's happening around this. Uh, Maker Ed is has uh, organized an open portfolio project, and um, we had a couple of webinars over at. Uh, I feel like a broken record. You know, I keep mentioning Connected Learning, but at ConnectedLearning.tv. I don't know if you saw those, but um, it was there were some really fascinating conversations from uh, both historically people who have um, been engaged in and thinking about um, reflective processes over time, um, regardless of whether they're involved in you know like physical making or not, and um, and then specifically the group that is part of this open portfolio project. Um, so I'll put the links in. I think they're really worth um, checking out. And one thing that I just wanted to raise that you know really struck me during one of the conversations was this notion of, in terms of reflecting um, while you're making, uh, I think it was Andrew Slowinski from DIY.org raised this question that he has had about, um, so if we ask kids to reflect you know, on the process while they're in the midst of the process, does that you know, interrupt the, the making to the point where like, it becomes counterproductive? And, um, and uh, um, Kylie Pepler from Indiana University uh, mentioned some research, and I don't remember who you know the researcher was, but who um, talked about, or in the literature, someone has talked about this notion of um, reflecting on, you know, and reflecting in. Like so, when you're in the midst of the process, you know, how how is it possible to reflect on what it is that you're doing, and then after the fact, you know, reflecting on what it is that that occurred. Mm -hmm. So I just think that there are this whole range of questions that are really fascinating about um, you know these I, these notions of reflection and also the portfolio process that you know you raised, Paul. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're getting up to the end of the hour here. So when I go around and hear some um, last comments, and Paul, if we could come back to you for um, <laughs> get ready um, for some specific things to mention on air here um, for where to go to continue um, this kind of thinking, I mean, I know you've said it, but again, but Chris, could we start with you, um, your final thoughts here? Sure. This evening there in Galway. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot to think about with all this, but I just think back to yesterday, yeah, yesterday in our group, and, um, you know, we, we carved out time for people to work with, you know, the um, paper circuits. And uh, no one knew really anything about them going into it. And um, our, our knowledge of, you know, circuits was pretty sketchy as a group. But, uh, you know, as this group worked together, that's what I started thinking about, like the quilting bee and stuff. There was just this joy of celebration of each other's successes that was pretty powerful. That was happening at the same time as Paul's group was doing it? You guys should yeah, have it. close to that same time. <laughs> Few it's hours fun. apart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Joshua, do you want to say anything? Uh, you've been listening. Are you there still? No. Okay. We'll go on. Michelle, any kind of final thoughts? Yeah. You know, I think uh, Oops, my final there thoughts. There he comes. Joshua, are you there? Is, is oh, Josh sorry, I had to unmute my. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, my, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, to uh, to to listen, I don't uh, don't have any special words of wisdom. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Michelle. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, from from my perspective as a teacher educator, um, I really have seen how maker projects that we've integrated into our curriculum have really helped our students who are teachers 
think in new ways about the importance of process. Um, and it's the coming together, the act of coming together around this shared purpose and being in that space and iterating um, that they've told us over and over again is really, really valuable for them. So I'm really starting to think about making as a paradigm for professional development. Um, that's, that's where my head is at right now. Cool. Thanks. Tom and Dan, any thoughts there, guys? Tom and Dan, is that, whoop, you're muted or something. Yes. Maybe you're not. Well, go over on Chris's yeah. computer and say something. <laughs> yeah. Here, we'll get him over here. <laughs> it's okay. And Paul, do you want to kind of... They're, they're, they're good. They're coming. They're okay, good. good. Hi, guys. Um, something I'll get the right thing. Something uh, has helped me think about is, um, is, is that even though I might not be teaching... Uh, anything terribly new, but finding a new way to teach something that I have been teaching over time is always a good thing. You know, walk, walking around my classroom like an elephant is not uh, necessarily uh, engaging for all of my students while uh, finding a new way to play a familiar song on, on oranges or something will engage them in a different way, and that, that has power as well. And I, uh, this conversation made me think back to um, a conference that I was at, and I heard from two students at DeWitt High School in Michigan where they described that they were building a 3D printer so that they could then print out pieces to make their own 3D printer. And I just thought there was something so inventive in that. And, and I asked them, and the iterative question was, are you giving yourselves homework? And they said, yes, every night. We, we, are, we are doing more than we need to do. And they're given an hour a day at DeWitt to build this 3D printer, and they are probably having more fun and learning more in that hour than they are probably in any other classes. And that's what I always think about. Like, if I had that opportunity, I think I would be just so much more engaged in the whole school process. Cool. And Paulo, thank you for keeping us all connected through uh, Educator Innovator and uh, Summer to Make, Play and Connect. But, um, and we can mention those websites again, but where else um, could we go? Yeah, I would say, uh, if you check out the educatorinnovator.org site, you know, you'll see a number of our partners who are very much at the forefront, I think, of, of uh, these kinds of uh, making activities and thinking about, you know, all these questions that were raised today. I mean, what a, an amazing and rich conversation. Um, so I, I think that's my plug, Educator Innovator. And I would just say that, you know, a couple of, um, my couple of final thoughts, and I'll make them really quick. One is that, uh, you know, I, I feel like we're in in the midst of a movement. You know, that's what that's what it feels like to me. And so I think that that is you know really exciting. And and I feel like um, conversations like this contribute you know towards the momentum of that movement. Um, however, we name that movement. Um, you know, whether it's the making movement or whether it's the connected learning movement. Um, and then the the, la the last thing that I would say is, uh, you know, the the con I, I guess as much as I. Uh, so I do love all of this work, and, and I feel like the question that I have is, uh, you know, how do we ensure that these kinds of experiences occur for, for all youth, um, you know, and in particular, I think, non-dominant youth who, I, who are um, sometimes not always represented, you know, in the making movement, uh, you know, at least on the surface from what I can see. Um, so I think that's my question. Um, you know, how do we, how do we engage and, and ensure um, access for all? Cool. Great questions um, to end us with. Uh, we will be back on Teachers Teaching Teachers on the same day as usual, which is Wednesday, for TTT 404 um, <laughs> um, at, I'll get this right, at 6 p.m. in Galway. Is that right? Yes, 1, 1 p.m. in um, Eastern Time and uh, Pacific Time. That would make 10. it 10. Okay. Anyway, and we'll um, if you go, I, that is announced, I think, on the calendar at um, Educator Innovator and um, and and at edtechtalk.com/ttt, um, you'll find it. Um, edtechtalk.com is a channel of the World Bridges Network, and um, we're here usually on Wednesday evenings. Um, but we're, we're playing around with time this summer. So thank you all for your contributions and this conversation. Um, so, uh, Sylvia Martinez will be with us, I think, um, um, yeah. on the 16th, if I have the date right. Um, 
so join us back again. Um, thank you all. Uh, we do, uh, when we go out here, also thank um, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier, who hooked up the um, EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Or, good night. See you. Good, good afternoon. Good morning. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Talk to you. Bye. Bye. Hey, Dan.